So um, when I was little, one of the exciting things that we did around Thanksgiving time was we went from Chicago to Indiana, Fort Wayne, Indiana. That doesn't sound super exciting at the surface, but let me tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> my great aunt Leola would host us for Thanksgiving and it would, you know, my sisters and my, my parents and I would drive there and then aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and my great grandfather, the whole tribe would be there. And aunt Leola cooked the whole meal. Well, from the time that I, you know, was told it was Thanksgiving time again, until we drove the three hours plus the stops, plus ate the dinner and had the socializing before, I waited the whole time for Aunt Leola's pumpkin pie. That's all I could think about because it was the best. It was out of this world. And when I went to visit her when she was 100, maybe she was 101 by then, every Saturday she baked a pie because she loved to cook and to bake. So I don't know about you, but when I'm 100 or 101, I want to be doing what I love. How about you? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And so it is that which we love that is just in us, you know, that's just in our cells. It's in every, it, it, we breathe it. We feel it and we breathe it. And sometimes it's the things that we love that we don't even realize, uh, you know, we don't even think about it because it's just so natural for us. To do it you know how that is like people will say oh you're so good at that or something like that or you'll say that you'll admire that in someone else and it's like but it's so natural to them because it's what they love and it's love made visible when we do the things that we really love you know people can see that and admire that and feel that and it's tangible and it's inspiring i mean i remember when i was in the um Silent Unity Prayer Vigil Chapel just kept praying about what is my ministry? And then, you know, out of the blue comes this, you know, out of the blue, <laughs> through spirit, come, <laughs> that's, that's what that means. <laughs> A little spiritual translation for you there. Um, what came to me was to lead bike rides around the world. And I was, I literally like spun around. <laughs> I'd been praying for what was my ministry, and that seemed really like, how could that be a ministry? And I didn't end up really, lead, I, one bike ride, I think, but I ended up then launching Unity Rising and, and taking people on spiritual trips around the world and, and doing retreats um, and that kind of thing. So I would have never thought of that, though, by my own mind, you know? By the limitation of the human mind, I wouldn't have thought of that. But of course, it was by my own mind and my own heart that I connected with the divine intelligence of the universe. And that just dropped in. And that's how it works. That's how it happens. It's a birthing process, right? It's a birthing process of conception to carrying to birthing. <laughs> all, all the way through. Those things that we love it sometimes come that way and sometimes they just, we don't even know, they just, it's just something we do. Like Aunt Leola, I don't think she thought about divine ideas or sitting in prayer or any of that. I think she just baked pies because she loved to. She, you know, that's just what she did. And so, it, so sometimes it's that simple, it's that hearty kind of simple, you know, way of being that is also what we um, are made to do what we are built to do to make God visible in the world. Imagine before, you know, before time, when we look at the, the story of Genesis, of, of how things were created, and that story of, you know, th that God was moving across the face of the deep. And it was one, it was one energy, it was one principle. So like a fish in water, how could it possibly know itself if it didn't have yet form? If it's all just one spirit, one love, one essence, one intelligence. So it created us and all of life, the birds of the sea, the fish of the air, the creepy crawling things upon the earth, and human beings, so that it could know itself. And then in the fantastic way in which cre creation has been made, we then perpetuate more of spirit shape and form spirit in the world by what it is that we create and the ways that we serve and work. So humbling, really, and so powerful and so amazing what we choose to do, what we, the ways that we choose to allow God to be made visible in the world through us. It's a sacred privilege. You know, some people say work is a necessity, you know, just something to to collect a paycheck so that you can feed yourself and your family. And while that's really important <laughs> and valuable and essential, it's just the, you know, the very top, the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? 
because it's really a sacred privilege. It's a sacred privilege to serve, to shape, to form, to, to give way to spirit into the world. Marge Piercy is a, a, a poet that wrote To Be of Use that has been read, uh, I don't know, for how many decades in uh, how many different scenarios, and I'd love to share it with you now. It's got several stanzas, so you might want to just close your eyes and really take it in. The people I love best jump into work head first, without dallying in the shallows, and swim off with sure strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black, sleek heads of seals, bouncing like half-submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals and field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire be put out. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears the hands and crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing, well done, has a shape that satisfies, clean and evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums. But you know they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Yeah. The pitcher cries for water to carry. And spirit cries for you to be its hands and its feet, its heart, and its eyes, its ears in the world. To give all that you have to the world so that God can know itself and be made visible. That's what we're really talking about when we talk about heaven on earth, manifesting heaven on earth. It's being the channel for the source. In a way, we all have the same job. We're all channels to the source, <laughs> for the source. You know? And then in the many, many different diverse ways that we do that, you think about, you know, just to begin to think about how we use our hands to grow food and then to shape the thing that holds the food, that brings it to the table, and then it's somebody made the table. You know, you get going and it's just, it goes on forever and ever. Or those of you who use your hearts and your minds for things that maybe feel a little bit less tangible, you know, to, to help somebody who has a grieving heart or to heal a body as a doctor or a nurse might do, or to, to help somebody move through in their spiritual growth or to educate a young mind like a teacher will do. You know, or to take your hands and to, to work with spirit in the co-creative process of creating art and beauty. You know, to use your hands, to let your hands be used to, to be the painter or, or the one who writes or the one who dances to use your body. You know, all these things that we do. And if you are somebody who works in those areas where it's a little bit less tangible and it's more of a service that you provide rather than the creation of some kind of product, then you probably will find great satisfaction in the more simple tasks that you do. At least I know that's true for me, you know, and back in the Midwest, we, back there we used to mow our lawns and, and uh, water our lawns. I think we still do because it's not quite as severe of a drought uh, or it hasn't really hit in that area. And for me, it was like one of the most satisfying things to do on the weekend was to mow the lawn or maybe weed some too on a hot day and then just sit on the porch with a cool drink and like survey my work. You know, anybody ever have that satisfying experience? Like, yep, it's done, it's wrapped up, and it's like, feels really good. So for some of us, those kinds of tasks may be important to sort of balance that feeling of, of completion, of accomplishment. And for others who, who work with their hands all the time, to begin to, to tap that creative energy that comes through and to really consciously recognize that what we do is not just a task or a list of tasks or a to-do list, but it's infused with a sense of sacredness, a sense of aliveness, 
a privilege to be the one who gets to be the channel for this particular work, for this particular project, for this particular thing. David White, the poet, said, work is a place where self meets the world. And self, like the big self, the big S self, you know, the higher power within us. It's that, that self that moves through us. And, it, and in, in that place where it meets the world is where it starts to become that tangible gift, that form of life that we're offering. And so for you, you may be, I don't know, we're all in different places and at different times, even in the context of the same job or the same form of service, there's an opportunity to create and recreate ourselves and create and reshape our world to discover and shape ourselves as we discover and shape the world. And so what is it for you? What is it in your life that is, you know, sort of knocking at the door of your heart that wants to be created? What's next? What's new? What's becoming through you? To consider that and to feel that energy, to begin to tap that energy, maybe you just sit with it and, and it'll come. Or, you know, I've been on a writing retreat the last week, so I've, I've really come back around to the love of journaling and allowing just whatever spirit wants to say to flow onto the paper. And then, ah, I've got something there. I can hold and I can read and I can see. You know, so it's, it's like that, that allowing for the prayer to come out of you. <laughs> so that you can see what's next for you, to tap that place where, where that altered place, that altered realm, that heavenly realm is accessible to us, and it is accessible to us every moment, every breath, every pause. Tomorrow is Labor Day, and so today we're celebrating our labors in a way, but it's also, it's meant to be a day of rest. It's meant to be a day of pause, and if we put those pauses, those rests, those times of prayers into our days, oh, what a difference it makes in, in what we create, because then we are constantly attuning to our creator and, and in the co-creative flow, rather than doing it by our own hands. We had a saying at Silent Unity and that we had up on all the, it wasn't a saying, it was a scripture, but it is through, through I, that, not I, but the Christ within that does the work. It is not I, but the Christ within. And it was a great reminder over and over again, not to get caught up in the ego or the thought process of this is me and mine to do and within the limitations of what I consider myself as a human being, but it is mine to tap that, that passion, that spirit, that creativity. So you might be in a place in your life where you're thinking, what's next? Or you want to infuse something that you're doing. And so to go back for a moment to that metaphor of the process of the creation of life is really helpful. <laughs> to think about how as we open ourselves, as we become receptive, as we open our hearts and our minds in prayer and meditation, might open your body up in yoga or tai chi or qigong or something like this. And, and so as you open more, you open that space for receptivity. You open that space for divine ideas. You create fertile soil for, for the seed of divinity to come in, the idea to come in and to be planted there. And then once it's planted there, it's kind of like something you want to keep close to your heart, you know? It's, there's a time to share and there's a time not quite yet. You know, when my sister was pregnant, she would wait until after the first trimester to start telling people because she had a couple miscarriages and it got really painful because people would ask all the time, you know, so she just said, you know, I'm waiting. I'm waiting until I'm showing. <laughs> and so you can wait till you begin to, to want to show, to want to put out in the world, to be more ready. And in the meantime, you carry that in you. You carry that, that thing that wants to be, if you will, birth through you, that idea that wants to be made manifest through you, that wants to become visible through you. But for now, it's, it's gestating, it's developing, it's sitting, you're, it's, you're feeling into it, you're connecting with it. So my roommate Alice has, um, is a surrogate parent, and she just had her baby this week. It had the baby, not her baby. She had a baby for this German couple and it is theirs biologically and legally, is an amazing thing to watch. I mean, to give the gift of life like that and to be able to take that on and to open yourself to conceive of that and to carry and then nourish that life and all the while knowing you are giving this away as a gift. 
they named the baby Theodore, which Theos means God. And it just is so right <laughs> that this great gift of life was given and carried out of just the gift to give to somebody who wanted to have a child and couldn't. And so these young parents traveled across the sea from Germany to be in the delivery room. And once she had the baby, it was handed over to the mother and the mother became the mother. <laughs> And so to watch though that process, and Alice was amazing through the process. I mean, strong, but yet so concerned, you know, really careful about her body and what she ate and how she took care of that baby. And we would feel the baby moving and it was just kind of a, wow, how's this gonna be for Grace? And how is it for us, you know, to have this life growing here that's going to be gifted? So what a, what a just beautiful thing to watch. And then the delivery came. The time of delivery came this week, actually. So I'm busy writing, and Brenly was creating things for her new work and logos and sending them to me and a you know, website. And then, and then Alice goes into labor. <laughs> it was like, wow, so much creativity going on here. <laughs> and Alice went into labor after working a 12-hour shift in a hospital in Sacramento, drove home, slept a few hours, knocked on Brenly's door and said, hey, I'm um, gonna drive myself to the hospital now, it's time. <laughs> and I mean, she's really made it look easy. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you are thinking about having a child, I've got somebody you can talk to. <laughs> and sometimes it is easy, you know, it doesn't always have to be painful, it doesn't always have to be laborious, the things that we're bringing into the world. And sometimes it is, you know? Sometimes there will be big challenges because anything worth doing, you know, sometimes has that big challenge to it, some level of giving over of ourselves to something greater. And so a willingness then to move through the stages and to go to that place of, of the labor, to bring forth this, this baby, this child, this creation, this form, this service, whatever it is that you're called to. The passion that's living in you, that's breathing you, that's moving through you, that's pumping through your veins, wants nothing more than to be known in the world. Sometimes it's a rekindling of an old dream, you know? The lizard is a, is an, um, in animal medicine, Native American medicine is the rekindler of dreams. And I, before we moved here, Brenly and I lived on a nature reserve that was a University of California nature reserve in San Inez Valley, 6,000 acres, that was our backyard. It was fabulous. And just to go out and just, you know, walk forever, you know, just walk. And one summer day I was out walking and it was the pretty, pretty much the height of the drought. And um, along comes this lizard, pretty good size one, and just sits in the middle of the path. You know, like, hey, I got something for you. <laughs> it's like really interesting. And so I went up to it and I was just looking at it and I was drinking some water. And I thought, wow, he's probably really thirsty. You know, no water anywhere really for quite a ways away from him. So I just gave him a little drop and he sort of seemed to react to it and he didn't run away. So then I got a little bit closer and I gave him another little drop. And he seemed really happy to have it. And then the most amazing thing happened. He just opened his mouth wide like a baby bird, and I just gave him a long drink. It was, it was just so beautiful. And then he just, you know, sort of did his lizard thing off into the grass, and it sort of waved behind him. And I was left just standing there going, wow. Wow, you know, did that just happen? <laughs> But what a gift, you know, what a moment to be present in the moment to what is on our path, literally. To, that's, that's the way we want to move about the earth, isn't it? To be, if we don't give, if we get so stuck in our to-do list and the things we have to do and the outcomes we have and what's, what's next and where we, we miss it all. <laughs> and so it is these rests, these pauses, these times of opening is when we, the inspiration really comes, the clarity comes. So the rekindler of dreams, there he is in the pathway. And I've been thinking about the fact that I was ready to be back in a spiritual community, serving one community, you know, in one larger community. And, and so really, in a way, I could say, thank you, Lizard, for sending me here. <laughs> Little messenger of God. 
So there's always a gift available to us, you know, and, and, and a zillion gifts of our own that have yet to be discovered. You, I mean, you can be 100 years old or 120, and there's still more, and there's still more. There's still more wanting to be known through us, wanting to be given and served through us, offered, and, and then in so doing, received, right? As we give, we know we always receive if we're doing what it is that we are meant to be doing. Otherwise, it feels burdensome and heavy and not so fun. And there may be those times in, in something worth doing because there are times of grit that we need to move through to get to what it is that we're birthing in the world, what it is we're midwifing into the world. And it's ourselves, really, too. And that's what David White is talking about when he's talking about the self meeting the world, the definition of work, is it's also ourselves that we're shaping and discovering. You know, as we give of our gifts, we're shaping and discovering ourselves. We're finding what we ourselves are capable of, and more and more it turns out. The more we step in, the more we step up, the more we open up, the more we see there's more and more of God that wants to be known through us. And so it becomes this stream of power and creativity and fluidity and flow and joy and excitement when we're aligned with that and it's ever so humbling. And that opens us even further. So it is this journey and this path that is a joy when we are on this trajectory of God's will to know itself through us as the channels of the source. Teresa of Avila, one of my favorite mystics, says, Christ has no body on earth but yours. There is no body for Christ anymore. It's yours. It's your hands. It's your eyes that look out upon the world and see with compassion. It's your hands that reach out and heal in whatever ways are yours to reach out and heal. Sometimes it's just a a hug or, you know, a, a touch on somebody's hand or a look into somebody's eyes that is the, the service that is needed or wanted. And so to be in those places at the right time, just all it takes is us being open and present, ready to receive at any time, to carry, to carry that gift and that idea with us, to nourish it, to water it with patience and commitment so that it can come forth and be all that it's meant to be. And, it, and the best of things is that we don't really get to see in advance what it's going to look like. I mean, I say that's the best. It's frustrating sometimes, right? Because <laughs> we want to see the whole picture. We want to see the outcome. We want to see it revealed. We want to know where we're going. We want steps A, B, and C. I mean, at least most of our egoic selves want that kind of control over the process. <laughs> But the, the, that's not the way it works. <laughs> bad news, the bad news, good news is it's not the way it works. <laughs> because if we were to see, I think a lot of us would go, oh, not me, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, when Moses was told to go tell the Israelites and he's like, I mumble, I'm not, no, <laughs> not me. I'm not the mouthpiece, I'm not the orator, you know. So we, it's hard for us to see the whole picture, and that's why we don't. I mean, there is, a, there is some, a, there's some sense, reasonability behind the mystery. <laughs> so we see what we see, and then we move ahead, and we see what we see, and we move ahead, and that is that creative shaping discovery process. It's the greatest of moments of human existence, David White says, when what we do we know is right for ourselves is also good for the world when those two things line up that i know that what i'm doing is good for me and it's good for the world i mean those are the best of moments right and sometimes we we get one and we don't get the other and then but it's those moments when they come together that's the magic that's the magic moment that we want that's the the feeling and the knowing that we want and it will indeed come it had to have come for alice at the moment that you know, she birthed this baby into the world, and then these, this German couple who she's become friends with over time, you know, got to the joy. I mean, I saw a picture right afterwards, and I tell you, I, I haven't seen joy like that, and, you know, just framed. It was just pure, unadulterated joy. And that's what it's like when you bring your gifts into the world and allow them to be manifested, allow God to be made visible through you. 
So wherever you might be feeling a little bit held back or a little resistance or a little uncertainty or trying to move away from, I want to encourage you instead to relax into, to breathe, to step forward, to move out. Because you're needed. Christ has no body but yours in the world. You're being called. And it's never too late. Aunt Leola was 100. <laughs> So I want to close out with the Indian writer Tagore. This may be a, faint, a known one to you. He says, I slept and dreamt that the world was joy. I awoke and realized that life is service. I acted and behold, life is joy. And service is joy. <laughs> So this week, let's recognize, let's think of Alice, if you will, of the ease in which you create and also the joy in which we serve. And let's know this together in our affirmation as we close out today. I create with ease. I serve with joy. Let's say that together one more time. Create with ease. I serve in joy. So it is.